Ideas and Insights provides a rich analytical framework for thinking about some of the most pressing issues of our time. Engaging, enlightening, bold and original, Ideas and Insights offers new vistas for making sense of the world. Join us here on this channel. I am Badrinath Rao, your host for Ideas and Insights. Hello and welcome to Ideas and Insights. I am Badrinath Rao, your host for this program. One of the most aggravating aspects of contemporary life is the canker of competition. It starts from childhood and torments us until we die. For most of us, life is an endless variation on the theme of achievement. We are consumed by the desire to surge ahead, be on top of our game, reach the apex of our profession, make more money than others, and amass power over fellow human beings. Barring a handful, this is the gist of life for most people across the globe. What drives us relentlessly throughout our lives is the inevitable logic of becoming. I am poor, I want to become rich. I am dumb, I wish to become intelligent. I want to be famous because no one knows me, and so on. Conditioned to embrace this worldview uncritically, we approach life as a zero-sum game, a championship where all that matters is winning. Life is thus a blood sport in which both the victors and the vanquished are bruised, blighted, and burnt out. Unmindful, generation after generation, the match goes on. We often ignore the heavy toll our petty successes extract at the individual level. One might become rich or highly accomplished in one's career. Regardless, these glittering achievements often uh, masquerade broken relationships, dysfunctional family ties, toxic personalities, and an emptiness that mocks our morbid obsession with becoming somebody in a world that couldn't care less about our existence. In addition, the successful have to grapple with the unavailing sense of inadequacy and chronic performance anxiety that come in the wake of achievement. Tragic as this is, it pales into insignificance when we consider what unthinking competition and a vaulting appetite for advancement do to the less privileged. Those who do not succeed or cannot compete for reasons beyond their control suffer intense psychic trauma. Instead of empathizing, we heap scorn on them and belittle their humanity. They languish on the periphery even as the winners spare no effort to remain at the top of the pyramid and thwart others from clambering on. Hence, we see rising inequality, the erosion of social solidarity, wasteful consumption amid unrelieved penury, and the destruction of our environment. Our unexamined assumptions about life, our identity, and the purpose of our existence undergird the collective harakiri. We valorize variously as achievement, competition, and success. For instance, we think human beings are hardwired for hierarchy and competition. We denounce failure as a flaw in one's personality and attribute it to sloth. We have also convinced ourselves that market-driven values are the benchmarks for progress. We believe that technological innovations and market forces are panaceas for intractable problems 
such as inequality, precarity and ecological destruction. We barely reckon with the spiritual language we endure and its intergenerational consequences in our mass stupor. Amidst this encircling gloom, we have a new book offering a radically novel blueprint for organizing our individual and social lives. Dr. Avram Alpert, writer, public intellectual, and lecturer in the writing program at Princeton University, is the author of The Good Enough Life, a new book published by Princeton University Press this year. As an antidote to the rat race of our times, he proposes what he calls the good enough life. A good enough life is a sustainable life that fosters interdependence, inclusion, and empathy. Dr. Alpert argues that individuals can flourish without the burdens of perfection and lead meaningful lives by focusing less on getting the best for themselves and more on becoming the kind of people who can participate in a good enough world. Dr. Alpert criticizes our unthinking celebration of greatness, a way of ordering the world so that some humans are considered better than others and humanity is considered better than nature. He says this pernicious value corrupts our character, corrodes social bonds, and hurts our self-esteem. Dr. Alpert maintains that living to the full is not maximization, but rather a meaningful appreciation for being human, including its tragic dimensions. He avers that our political structures inflict tremendous damage by rewarding the great while ignoring the many. He advocates decency and sufficiency for all to create a just and vibrant society. A significant strength of Dr. Alpert's book is that it alerts us to eternal verities that condition our lives and make us human. He points out that life is imperfect and we are not destined for greatness. Hence, he favors a good enough life based on cooperative economic governance non-oppressive hierarchies, and a means of distributing esteem and political voice in society so that no one gets excluded solely because their talents are not recognized in the marketplace. Dr. Alpert joins me now to elaborate on these ideas. Welcome to Ideas and Insights, Dr. Alpert. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Professor Rao, for having me and for the lovely introduction. I feel like I don't have much more to add now. You've really laid out the whole case. You're very, you. very welcome. Thank you. Let's begin with your idea of the good enough life. Can you tell us what you mean by the good enough life? Sure. Well, I mean in the sense um, not just what we might hear when we, we hear good enough at first, which would be something like, well, you know, it's I, I built this table and it's not great, but it'll hold the object. You know, it's good enough. Um, I want some of that to come across. I want this idea that we need a more leisurely or something more relaxed life is definitely part of it. Um, but also that good enough packs uh, multiple meanings into it, that it is good. We're not just talking about mediocre or, or adequate. We're talking about something that is decent, as you said, that's meaningful, that's purposive, mm -hmm. but it's also enough. We wanna combine these two things together, that what it means to, to live a meaningful human life requires that we have enough uh, housing, um, clothing, food, education, care. Uh, but we also recognize, right, that we can't, as you said in your introduction, uh, innovate or, or, or um, change our lives in such a way that will escape imperfection. It's just, it's part of our condition. We can remove removable sufferings. You know, we, we can make sure that people are, are fed and clothed and respected, uh, but we can't have 
we can't do anything about someone loving someone other than you. You know, we can't do anything about unrequited love or accidents that occur. Um, these are part of our condition and we should accept them. And by doing so, I think we can return our focus on each other, on the decency and the quality of each other, instead of putting all of our hopes in some great people who in theory will get us out of this condition. I don't think we're going to get there. And in, in looking at that, we're distracting ourselves from our ordinary everyday decency uh, and care for each other. So that's that's largely where that, that comes from for me is this combination of ideas, decency, sufficiency, and, and imperfection uh, as being linked to, to make a, a world that works for all. How did you arrive at this idea, Dr. Alpert, and what motivated you to write a full-length book on this topic? So the, the phrase good enough, I took originally from a psychoanalyst named Donald Winnicott. Mm -hmm. And Winnicott talks about parenting. And he says, when we're parents, we have a very logical desire to do everything for our children, right? Mm -hmm. We wanna give them the, the best in everything. We wanna give them all of ourselves. Um, but the problem is when we do that, we actually take away much more than we realize. We take away a lot from ourselves because we're putting all of this pressure on ourselves to be constantly giving and attentive. And at the same time, we're taking away a lot from the child. It's not actually great for the child to get everything, to have all their wishes fulfilled. This creates false expectations in life. And it robs our children, Winnicott says, of their what they learn from their failures or from their frustrations, their ability to be creative and to be adaptable. And I thought that, you know, this, this describes a lot of what we do in society. Just mm -hmm. as the parent puts all of their focus on the one child, we often put all of our focus on the few who are deemed worthy of excessive attention and care. And it's both bad for that person, right, who has, as you said in the introduction, all of these burdens on them and all this constant pressure for success, but also because it tears us apart as a society. We wind up with winners and losers, people who are in groups and out groups. Um, and a lot of our talents, our virtues, our, our capacities are ignored. And as I thought through, you know, what kind of world I, I lived in um, and what I was seeing around me, where there was constant major issues, right, in inequality, in social distrust and dysfunction, um, in who was benefiting economically or socially during a pandemic, you know, how much money people were making off of other people dying. Um, all of this was just kind of pounding in, in my head. And I said, this is, this is too much. And there has to be another way to think about how to organize a world. Um, and so it, it has deeper roots. It's pre-pandemic for me. You know, I started writing this book a few years ago, um, just really thinking about how so much of what I was seeing and, and reading and hearing was about this sense that people had that they were missing out on things. And that I was, to be perfectly honest, feeling my, myself, you know, I was doing fine in, in my life and I've been teaching at, at Princeton, although I'm, I'm on my way out there, uh, but I hadn't quite, you know, had the, the successes that maybe I'd imagined. And I think that was like the, the child in Winnicott's story, a very good thing for me because it broke my sense that, okay, I was really special and I deserved all these things and, and I would keep getting rewarded as I go. And I had to sort of step back and, and look and say, wait, maybe it's not just that, that I'm not getting this, but that this whole system is really wrong. There's something really flawed here. And that my own expectations, my own sense of, of how, what I should expect to receive from the world was tied into a lot of the things that I was criticizing, right? I'd be critical of economic wealth, uh, but I wasn't necessarily criticizing positional power. People have a voice in society and the capacity to speak or, or the ways in which people have access to education and ideas. And I needed right. to enlarge my analysis. And so I went back to Winnicott and, and really then thought that through on this model of, of society at large. We will come to positional uh, goods um, uh, momentarily. Let's begin mm -hmm. with an issue that you raise early on in the book, the question of greatness. You argue mm -hmm. that our obsession of greatness is fatal, it causes enormous psychic damage and uh, hurts social cohesion. How do you define greatness, Dr. Alpert, and why are you opposed to it? <laughs> so I think of greatness um, as a system in which, uh, you laid out the definition really nicely in your introduction, but a system in which, right, um, our value as, as humans is determined by our ability to rise to the top of our given profession or family relationship or sense of self. 
Um, and then that, that also correlates in how we view the natural world, right? That we are greater than it. And also that nature, right, is great, is kind of endless. And what I was interested with this term greatness is that it was linking these various ideas. You know, we see a lot, and I think there's some wonderful books written um, asking us to question our ideas about human dominion over nature or about elitism or um, about winner-take-all capitalism or meritocracy and its flaws. And what I saw was that across these different things, there was something that, that connected them, which is really this idea that a great few deserve all of our resources, all of our attention, and that if we give this to them, it will somehow kind of trickle down to the rest of us, either economically or culturally. It will benefit the rest of us because we'll get to see their great inventions, we'll get to watch their, their art or their movies, um, and we'll kind of benefit because we've given those who are deemed the best uh, everything they need. But again, the, the problem is, as, as you point out, is when we do that, we're in fact excluding so much talent, so much virtue, so much human capacity, and reducing who uh, has the power to create and explore their voices and, and abilities in society. And I, I don't think that in, in criticizing what I'm, what I'm calling greatness, we, we lose uh, out on innovation and change and transformation. In fact, we bring many more people in and many more people are able to make their contributions. So greatness is that system of kind of looking top down, who deserves the most in society? Um, how can we extract the most out of nature? How can we kind of dominate and control things? And um, trying to look beyond that into a system that sort of says, well, you know, the world is good enough, we are good enough, and we all are deserving of, of having our voices heard and respected and feeling integrated into our world. Let me now uh, probe a little bit about this idea of being good enough. Early in the book you say that a good enough life is relaxing, but it is also difficult. Mm -hmm. And you argue that uh, being good enough oftentimes goes against human nature. What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this goes back a little bit to what I said with, with Winnicott, which is just that it's our, our temptation. It makes a lot of sense to want to give everything to our child, to really care for them and give them the best in, in, in everything that they can have in the world. Um, and so it's... The idea of being good enough is relaxing because it says to us, we don't need to do that. And in, mm -hmm. in fact, our doing that may not have the positive consequences that we imagine. Um, but it's also difficult because we have to resist a little bit this temptation, this desire to have so much for ourselves um, and to give so much to the people that we, we care about. And so it requires this kind of complicated way of thinking about ourselves as connected to others, um, as worthy and, and as decent, but still humble and aware of the, the needs and demands of other people. It's a, it's a real balancing act, a constant kind of dialogue or conversation. Uh, as opposed to just thinking, okay, I know what's right, I'm going to do what's best, um, even with the best intentions. Uh, but what we're doing, we say it's it's relaxing and it's difficult, is we're saying, okay, we actually don't have to do everything, um, but we need to learn these other ways of being with each other that require us still to provide enough, still to be decent, um, but that to really kind of embrace the complexity, the fullness, the strangeness of, of being human and being open to that and to new experiences and possibilities. You say in the book, Dr. Alpert, that good enough uh, life and outlook are essential for meaningful relationships. What is the connection between the two? Mm -hmm. Being good enough well, so, and having mm -hmm. meaningful relationships. Mm -hmm. I think for, for me, the, the way that I, I thought about this is, is that um, when we say good enough, part of what I mean is not just enough in resources, mm -hmm. material resources, but also emotional resources, right? That what part of our nature as human beings is that we require interactions with others. We require loving touch um, that's reciprocated. We, we require community. We require the ability to care for other people. A philosopher named Kim, Kimberly Brownlee has worked this out very very nicely in, in a book of hers um, that that what it you know part of our, our needs are not just material but they're also social and emotional at the same time and one of the things that Brownlee talks about very nicely in in her book building on on people like Winnicott and others is that 
if we, again, put all of our resources into one person or say everybody wants to hang out with just this one person, we think they're really cool or special. Mm -hmm. What's happening to our social life, right? What's happening to all the other people who are feeling excluded? This is a, a feeling I think we all know from, from growing up, from being in the in-group or being in the out-group or kind of moving between them through our lives, um, is that our relationships ships also cannot be just focused on one thing, right? We need people in our lives that care for us and care for others. And, it, you know, look, I, I try to say that these are not universal. I, this, this is not that a lot of people are more solitary and, and that's fine. And, and they're, you know, I'm not saying they need to go out and, and make friends, but as we engage in relationships, we need to understand that, that social complexity and also the fact that um, being in a relationship with someone, just like the parent-child relationship, we're talking about friendship or, or marriage, it's not about being perfect. It's not about being the person who gives everything all the time. In fact, part of what we find meaningful with people, I think, part of what I find meaningful in my relationships is that I, I love people and I care for people and, and I think I see the world in so many similar ways as them. But then there's these differences. There's this kind of strangeness, right? I don't understand how somebody thinks that. And that's exciting for me, right? That's part of the good enoughness of the, the relationship. It's meaningful, it's sustaining, but it's not perfect. And it's that kind of constant engagement and, and negotiation that I think really imbues the, the specialness of our relationship. Let me follow up on something you said just now mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. accepting people and uh, being mm -hmm. imperfect. You emphasize in your book that uh, we must accept that life is imperfect, and you go on to argue that this acceptance will make us uh, open, humble, and creative. But many others, uh, like uh, Confucius, Plato, Adam Smith, and so on, maintain mm -hmm. that being perfect is the sum and bonum of life. You don't agree with that view, do you? No, no, and Why I use them as examples. And yeah, no, I, I, I use those examples you give in, in the book um, as kind of almost stand-in names, because when we read the, the works of some of those people, as, as you know, their, their ideas get a bit more complex at times, but I think there's something really meaningful to, to that argument for human perfectibility, right? Mm -hmm. That our, our, I, our aim, our goal is really to take this, this raw mass of emotion and confusion and guide ourselves into being um, this kind of perfected uh, person who is the best at thinking or at doing or inventing or exercising, whatever it might be that we find our, our passion in. Um, and I don't want, I want to be very clear that my criticism in the book is not of um, excellence or, or skill or virtue or pursuing what you're good at. I think you should do that as, as much as you want. I just don't think that we should have social orders. And this is where I have my more strong disagreement with the, the philosophers that you named that are, are, I, that, that are predicated on, that are based on this idea that those who've pursued uh, their bestness and become as perfectable as they can, they should lead the rest of us or, or the rest of us should, you know, kind of bow down before the rest and say, okay, you know what's best for me. I'm going to follow your, your ideas. Uh, you had economic power or you had political wisdom and you're going to be right every time. I don't think that works out. And I think history shows us how much that doesn't work out. That so often when you have the so-called best and brightest um, they don't understand the complexities of living for people who aren't in that inner group. And so they're not able to make kind of policies or decisions that reflect um, everyone's lives or, or needs, which isn't to say that right, we should just, as we are, kind of willy-nilly say, okay, whatever everybody wants, they should get. No, we need to go through this process of negotiating and discussing and, and appreciating the fact that you know, we're not going to get everything we want, but we do have certain kind of needs and uh, emotional, social, um, uh, material needs that should be met. And so I, I don't want to say, and I want to kind of register my agreement with the idea that as much as people want, right, they should pursue their, their talents and their, their virtues and their capacities, but they should not feel that their worthiness in life or their place in society is solely dependent on them spending, you know, 20 hours a day in the library or the gym or the recording studio, um, that there is much more richness to be gained in a world in which all of us are doing a little bit less and therefore we're bringing more people in, right? If, if I'm doing a few 
you know, I'm doing a few interviews for this book and it's lovely and I love doing it, but I'm not going to be on every show and I don't want to be on every show. I want lots of other authors and lots of other ideas to kind of have their voices um, made and, and heard. And so it's, it's that balance that I, I really want to argue for um, and against some of the, the top-down perfectionist models. Thank you for that clarification. But it's not just the perfectionist view that you reject. You also don't have much use for another approach to life articulated by the Buddha, Rousseau, and Henry Thoreau, who say that we must lead simple, idyllic lives in tune with nature. Instead, you say that the good enough life is the way to go. Now, why do you think that the good enough approach to life is superior to the two perspectives that uh, I outlined just now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just as with um, the first set of thinkers, but obviously there's various complexities to the sure. thinking of, of Buddhism and Thoreau and, and Rousseau. Um, but I, I, in the same way as you mentioned, I kind of mentioned them as people who are associated with this kind of let's get out of our social order, let's go back to nature or remove ourselves from society, whether or not that's, that's exactly what they say. And my, my concern with, with that model is that our departure from, from the world, our kind of removing ourselves uh, from it, it's, it's not the worst thing I can imagine. Again, I, just as with the kind of perfectionist, I appreciate that criticism and I appreciate the idea that we should live much simpler uh, much more reduced, uh, consume, you know, reduce much less in our lives. And, and I do think that's an important part of it. But that um, it's about a kind of, you know, middle path between a, a more ascetic uh, approach and uh, a, a more perfectionist uh, approach. And that we can find in the good enough life something that, that provides what so many humans want, right? Um, uh, the kinds of decent housing and, and care, um, access to schools, access to transportation, access to pleasure. Um, I think that, that we can build a really meaningful platform for that uh, within, our, within our world for more people. And that we shouldn't go too far in the perspective we'll, we, we will never generate. I mean, I think it's hard enough to argue for the good enough life, right? But to argue for the extremely reduced life, I don't think we'll ever generate a kind of mass um, movement that could really connect around that that idea. And so it's not so much for me about kind of going back um, and it's not so much about trying to be perfect. It's about kind of trying to find that that good enough range in the middle in which we can assure everyone, really, I mean, really everyone and, and the world that we live in, right, sustainable um, environment, that our lives are going to be good and, and provide enough. And you know what that looks like for everyone, how they define those metrics is something why I think of this as a conversation, as, a, as an ongoing thing, and sure. why I love these, these questions. Thank you. Dr. Alpert, your clarifications are well taken. However, you have uh, very clearly stated in your book that you mm -hmm. don't like uh, competition and you don't mm -hmm. like hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And there are many who think that these traits are desirable and they're responsible for progress. So they might turn around and say that the good enough life is, is essentially a recipe for mediocrity, for mm -hmm. leading a slothful life. What do you say to such mm -hmm. people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I, <laughs> I, have a pre, I, 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 it's very hard to say precisely, but I do want us to kind of understand and appreciate that we may not always have the most talents about, like, if if the world entirely depended on one's ability to do calculus, if we find ourselves in a future where it's only about calculus. I will have no platform on TV. No one will publish my books. I can't do that, right? And I would find myself in a position, myself in a position, um, where my talents are not not recognized, and I would still want you know, in that world to be recognized as a human who has value and has purpose and has meaning. Um, and so what I'm trying to suggest is that, again, we, we don't want to get rid of expertise or quality or ability, but we want to remove a world in which the idea is that only if you defeat others uh, in competition, only in which you prove yourself to be the best in whatever series of professions or, or um, 
ways of thinking that we deem valuable as a society should you be respected and heard and understood. And I just think that that removes so much of the, the value of, um, of being human and, and being in a society with others on the specific points of hierarchy uh, and competition. I, I do try to say in the book, you know, there are ways of leadership is helpful. It is organizationally mm -hmm. helpful sometimes sure. to have, you know, someone in charge, but I try to talk about rotational leadership or non-oppressive hierarchies in which it's not just that one person rises through the ranks and they're the best and, and we all kind of follow what they do. If you, anyone, right, who's ever worked not for themselves knows that the boss isn't always right, often is, is wrong and often doesn't understand people's positions and workplaces, plenty of studies have been done about this, workplaces that are more democratic, that allow for more rotation, um, that have more voting procedures or ways in which, the, you know, even if there is some kind of leader, they are not able to unilaterally demand things. Those are happier places. Those are more productive places, just as with Winnicott and the parent, right? Sometimes what we think is going to get us forward is in fact something that is, that is pulling us back or, or causing problems for us. And similarly with competition, I mean, competition is fun, right? It can be really fun to go out and play and, and, and try to win. And there's lots of parts of life where it, it um, might make some sense. But again, when we think it through, when people have studied it, they don't actually find that competition brings out the best in us. It, it brings out sometimes the best competitor, right? The person who's most ruthless or most willing to do whatever it takes to win, but it doesn't necessarily bring out our abilities, our capacities. Um, it oftentimes will wind up in kind of uh, conformist procedures, right? We know, okay, this is what the judges want. So this is what we're gonna try to do. So it becomes, harder, in fact, to innovate or, or develop new ideas. Um, and it also, it splits us, right? So instead of working together, where, where knowledge, knowledge, especially in, in, a, in a technological societies like the ones we live in, is dispersed into all sorts of different fields. And when that knowledge is then kind of prioritized by particular companies or groups and isn't shared, we lose our ability to develop and create new things. And, and one great example is during World War II, uh, this is told by a story told by Daniel Immervar in, in his book on American uh, Empire. But he's just talking in, at this moment about mm -hmm. the desire to develop synthetic rubber in the United States. And he says there's this kind of amazing moment when all these people who worked for all these different corporations and kind of hid their knowledge from each other started working together for the government. And all of a sudden, it's this kind of golden age. And every, you know, they, they very quickly right. got this breakthrough in rubber. Yeah. So I think there are plenty of examples like that where our collaboration uh, does much more than our competition. Let me now turn to a point you referred to earlier, the question mm -hmm. of positional goods. Mm -hmm. Talking about the good enough perspective in the economic sphere, you invoke Fred Hirsch's notion of positional goods, and you say that inequality of material goods is bad, but just as deleterious is inequality of positional goods. What do you mean by this? Yeah, so Fred Hirsch was an economist, wrote this fantastic book. I mean, <laughs> it's a fantastically interesting book. It's a bit dense, and I'm not always sure I understand every element of it, but it's called <laughs> The Social Limits to Growth. And the argument that Hirsch makes, and, and this can be traced back, other people have ideas about this, but he analyzes it quite precisely. And he says there's a material economy and there's a positional economy. And when we talk about the material economy, you know, we're really talking about money, wealth, um, assets. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the, the positional economy, we're talking about position in society, uh, leadership positions, or if you're an artist, shows at blue chip galleries, or if you're, um, uh, a writer having a, an interview on, you know, I don't, I don't know, a show like this, or, or, or you know, a big national broadcast, um, right? But there's, there's only so many people who can be interviewed. Um, there's only so many uh, leadership positions available, or even things like real estate in Manhattan, right? It's an, it's an island, and it has a finite amount. So even though that is a kind of material good, it also winds up being a positional good because mm -hmm. it's a kind of about status in society and an ability to, to live in a particular place. And so what Hirsch says is that there's a relationship, there's a dynamic relationship between these things so that even if we're able to have a more egalitarian material economy, there's a risk that we won't be able to do that in the positional economy. And what that means is that, you know, say everyone here makes the same salary, but only some people get to go on vacation, 
or only some people get to make decisions uh, about society and, and what kind of direction we should go in, or only some people get to write their books and, and go on TV and, and talk about them. And not paying attention to those positional goods can have this um, back and forth with the material economy, because then what people are doing is, well, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, um, if there's only so much property in Manhattan, well, my best way, you know, for me as a professor, the best way to, to get it is to get a job at a university in New York that has housing. Okay, so I'm going to do whatever I have to do to make my way up through my positional economy, whoever I need to compete or throw away along the side, um, because that's that's where I, I want to be. And so there can be this kind of competition there. And it can be, and I, I think um, people like Michael Sandel uh, has written a book analyzing this called The Tyranny of Merit, which mm -hmm. is a very interesting book. And, and he talks about um, contributive justice, right? This idea that people need to be able to contribute to society, not just have goods in society, but be a meaningful part of it. And that can become a positional good that we that we lose and we don't recognize. And so th this idea of positional goods, I just think is a very important way of understanding things like um, status hierarchies or voice hierarchies or all sorts of other inequalities that we may not recognize when we just look at wealth uh, statistics. And that is an important part of understanding what a good enough world would look like. You talked about uh, Dr. Michael Sandel, uh, a foremost moral philosopher in the United States. He has written this acclaimed book, The Tyranny of Merit. And while you endorse his critique of meritocracy, you also have problems with the fact that he does not confront the question of greatness uh, and uh, he is, for example, critical of the ethic of success, but does not interrogate the content of success. Tell us more about that. So I, I think it's a, it's a very important book and, and really had an impact. Um, and I know that uh, in Germany in the last set of elections, the, the um, incoming chancellor talked with Michael Sandel about his book and really thought about what it means to challenge mm -hmm. Um, these kind of elements of society. And, and you know, so I want to say, like, as you said, I'm, I'm very much on board. I think for myself, like some other people who, who looked at his work, the, the broad argument is very good. And then when he comes to the solutions uh, at the end of his book, they're not as strong as maybe we expected them to be. Um, he, he will sort of say things like, if you have um, great wealth, still in, in a post kind of meritocracy society um, or position of power, you know, appreciate the other people who, who don't have that. And it's a little confusing to sort of say, okay, this is this whole problem, but still on the other side of this, there's gonna be people who have, just have so much more power than everybody else. And he seems to accept this a bit. And so I, I wanna push a little bit on, on that. Um, and he wants to, right, as you said, he wants to criticize the, the, what he calls the harsh ethic of success. This idea that if you don't succeed um, in society, you're you're not um, you, you're you're not valuable. You're not meaningful. You haven't done enough. Um, but he doesn't. I think he would. I just in, in the book he doesn't always talk about questioning what what does it mean to be successful. You know, can we just say, well, it's very successful to to live a, a life in which you work a job thirty five hours a week would be. Nice. I mean, I know people work much more than that, but in my scenario here, 30, 35 hours a week, um, and you raise a couple of children and, and you write poetry for yourself on the weekends, or you have watercolors, or you have your garden, um, and that's what counts as success. Um, and that we should really need to redefine, you know, that kind of wealth and power that he talks about as what constitutes being successful. And so I, I wanted to, while I'm, again, not really criticizing him, I just wanted to push on that, that end of that a little bit. Um, to hopefully continue that conversation about let, what happens after meritocracy. Let me ask you one last question on meritocracy before we move on to yeah. other things. You mm -hmm. also engage with the ideas of American philosopher Kwame uh, Appiah. And mm -hmm. again, you are largely in agreement with him, particularly mm -hmm. Appiah's uh, argument that everyone deserves respect and dignity regardless of the amount of talent they have or what they do with it. Yet, you have problems with Appiah's idea that we need a hierarchy in society and inequality to 
a significant extent in order to incentivize people to work. Tell us about that. Why do you find a peer's argument somewhat brittle, if I may say so? No, I, I, yeah, as you said, again, it is it's a kind of friendly disagreement, I think. But but my sense is that in, in his um, in his most recent book, uh, The Lies That Bind, he, there's a chapter on class and, and Appiah discusses uh, the idea of class identity. And, and he's very much critical of some ideas of the meritocracy. He says, we need a moral and political equality. But he kind of then, like, you know, like Sandel, he pulls back a bit and he says, well, but we're always going to have people who are more recognized because they're better. They're just, you know, they're, they're better writers or they're smarter mathematicians. And so we need to appreciate people who aren't that, but we do need to kind of incentivize those who are better to go out and, and do more. Now, my questions here is one of the things, one of the people that Appiah draws on and Sandel and myself is a man named Michael Young, British sociologist who coined the term meritocracy mm -hmm. as a, as a critical term, and right? he, he called it that because he said it was basically the aristocracy, um, but putting merit in as, as opposed to uh, the aristoi, which is effectively the same thing, the aristoi meaning the most excellent um, in, in the, the Greek. Um, but, but so Jung is really saying, what about a society that isn't based on merit, but is based on everyone being able to pursue what is valuable, what I've been saying a lot, valuable, meaningful, um, interesting to them. And Appiah really affirms this. Um, but he says, but still, you know, if we want to get the best novelists to go write another novel, they need more recognition, they need to be paid more. And I think that's a bit of a contradiction, because if the whole point is about finding a society in which we all do what we do because we love it, because we care about it, because it's meaningful for us, not simply for recognition, obviously recognition is, is nice, but we don't need so much. We don't need, um, you know, the... I, I don't want to name anyone specifically because I don't want to tell anyone to, but you know, they should stop writing or something. But sometimes, right, it's nice that if, if somebody maybe doesn't write another book, uh, but does say help someone who, who has gotten lost, who hasn't been able to find their ability or capacity or voice out there to, to bring their first thing in, into the public sphere and, and gain some traction there. And we also know, and I imagine that most people listening to this here know people who are extremely successful but the difference between them and someone else can be just a very thin line. And I wish I'd had this anecdote in, in my book, for example, but I read somewhat recently about Brene Brown, mm -hmm. you know, who is, I think, extremely popular um, psychologist, social psychologist, and, and very interesting woman. Um, and there's a line in this uh, New Yorker profile of her where they say the, the line between her becoming Brene Brown, multi-million um, copy selling uh, a book writer and Brene Brown, the kind of professor in Texas who no one's ever heard of, is, is one contact who puts her in touch with one agent who then, you know, really kind of launches her. And obviously then she has all this ability and, and capacity, um, but it could never, it might never have been recognized. It's also true for Albert Einstein. I mean, I know we all think now that Einstein is just, it's obvious and destined that he would become recognized, but he spent seven, eight years of his life working in a patent office, trying to get his papers published, trying to get a job. Um, and he had to have a friend get him this job in a patent office. Um, and, you know, we can tell these stories about these people because people write about them and we know them, but it's also true for lots of people that we don't know about. Lots of people who don't make that kind of switch over across the line. And so I, I disagree with Appy's idea that it's a necessary incentive because I think our incentives are doing the work we love and caring about the world and, and wanting to have a meaningful impact, not so much necessary reward. And it's not clear to me that we always actually recognize the best um, and that, you know, esteem naturally flows, as Appiah says, to particular people. Um, in fact, it's, it's a lot of luck and it's a lot of chance and we need to recognize that and think about, okay, whether, you know, again, whether or not someone has all of that talent, we may never know it. It may never get recognized. It may never get developed. And even if they never had that talent at all, they still need to be recorded. And, and here I very much agree with that, be a moral political equality. Um, but that to get there, we need to think a little bit more um, about, about the fact that having those talents or abilities doesn't, it's not natural or automatic that you, you get recognized for them, that there's so much virtue and capacity and possibility in the world. And, and that's what I want to draw on more. All right. In the limited time that we have, let me now turn to the uh, role of greatness in uh, our interpersonal relationships. You say that greatness can have 
a corrosive impact on relationships, particularly in the context of parenting. You talk about Amy Chua's uh, book on uh, her role as a tiger mom. And uh, you say that her obsession with parenting can sometimes have dreadful consequences for children. Point taken. Mm -hmm. However, there are two quick issues that I want to see clarification about. Number one, as you will agree, in the best of circumstances, parenting is not easy. They say that if you've ever raised a child, you would know why some animals eat their young ones. Okay, so it's not easy. Now, that having been noted, isn't it true that we are dealing with children who need discipline and sometimes you have to uh, exhibit what they call tough love in order to instill discipline. And secondly, there's a related point about children without guidance and mentorship sometimes might commit what could later prove to be a non-biodegradable mistake. So there is a fine line between being obsessed with greatness and uh, being a hands-on parent. Would you agree? Yeah, no, and I think that's very nicely put. And the, what do I want to say? The, the aim here is not to say that there's something wrong. I, I'm really not talking about parenting methods in that section of the book. I'm interested in parenting goals. And if we're using tough love, um, which I perceived a fair amount of in my life, fairly. Um, you know, it, it should be though not, I mean, often though for me, and, and I'm, I'm thankful for this, it's because I've been arrogant, right? Or it's because I've kind of thought that I was going to be great and my parents are trying to kind of instill a sense of humility and, and respect for other people's, you know, abilities in me. And that kind of tough love, I think, is, is really, I'm totally on, on board with. Um, but there's a different kind of tough love that's trying to get our children to think, you know, as, as Amy Twas says in, in her memoir, you know, that she wants her kids to be number one in every subject except gym and drama. And those don't matter. Those have no bearing on, on life. So sorry, exercise and, and creative expression. Um, all that matters, you know, is you play an instrument really well and you do math really well and you write really well. And there's this sense of, you know, she goes through this process in her memoir, sort of realizing she was too cruel often mm -hmm. as a parent. But at the end of the memoir, she still sort of says, well, I stopped being cruel, but only because I realized my child would still be better than everyone else, even if I wasn't cruel. And that didn't seem to me to fully come, come around to something new or to some new position, appreciating all the other you know, complexities of being human and working with others and being humble and those kinds of values. And so it's just trying to kind of get into that that realm where we're guiding our children um, to be decent caring people and we are doing that by being very present right very decent and caring but not perfect ourselves and this is again kind of back to winnicott's point um, the great parent who gives so much damages both themselves i mean i wouldn't want to be a parent like that who's just fully sure. dedicated to my child 24 7 because i'd be losing something and they would be losing something they would be losing their own abilities and capacities to grow and develop and appreciate the imperfections of life while talking about the economic contours of the good enough society you reject a trickle-down economics you reject neoliberalism and you criticize uh, Adam Smith and Hayek while acknowledging that they both understood that the economic order they were espousing could lend itself to corruption. But your critique of them is slightly different. You fault both of them for not engaging with this problem of greatness that you discuss in the book. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that. Mm -hmm. I think you know, Adam, Adam Smith, who people know, is the you know, kind of founder, philosophical founder of capitalism in the wealth of nations. But Smith had also written a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, mm -hmm. which I highly recommend. Because what Smith says in that book goes, you know, we probably know Smith as the person who says, well, it's by following your self-interest that you actually help everybody. And, you know, the butcher does what they do and it helps us all out. But in The Theory of Moral Sentiments, Smith says that our kind of self-care our obsession with ourselves is, is degrading. It's, it's bad. What we really what kind of brings us on as humans is our ability to love and empathize and care for others. And there's a real contradiction here. And what interests me is like, you know, why does Smith say this? And he's got this very robust theory. He says, what we want in life is to be loved. 
And what we want in life is to, to kind of feel the respect and empathy of others. And we look around as children and we see who gets empathy and love in, in life. Well, it's the rich and the powerful. They're the ones who everyone seems to care about. Maybe also the good and the wise, but much less so, and that seems harder. So we all then become, you know, we want to be rich and powerful because we want that love. And Smith thinks this is a really bad thing. He says it's the most degrading thing that happens to us. Um, this desire to be rich and great and powerful. But he says, what are we going to, you know, we can't change that. That's some kind of part of our human nature. And so he has to kind of find a way in which that corruption of our morals can be justified. And this is what he calls the invisible hand, basically. He says, okay, yes, this is all going to be really bad, but because we're going to um, all seek to be great, it's going to be okay because that in, there's going to be this invisible hand that's going to redistribute things. So as people get really wealthy, they won't be able to hold on to all their money. They'll have to kind of give it away and then it'll sort of trickle down. And I can appreciate that idea, but I, I think we all know, right, it doesn't work very well. It hasn't turned out to really function for most of us in society. It gets stuck and, and people wind up with absurd amounts of money while millions and millions every year die uh, in hunger and poverty. And so, they, you know, this justification system just doesn't hold up. Um, and so what I, what I ask is to sort of say, let's not follow the Smith path of saying, okay, this is just human nature. Human nature is complex and, and, and it's evolving and it changes and we can kind of find different things that we find meaningful. And so I ask us to, to think that through more, more deeply, not just, okay, people are always gonna to wanna to be great, what are we going to do? But okay, there might be some part of us that seeks greatness and power and, and that's fine and that's there. But there's so many other parts of us that seek community and care and love and respect for each other and decency and equality. And let's, let's build a society around those We'll have a bit of, you know, it won't be perfect, it'll right. be good enough, but let's build a society around those other virtues. We are almost out of time, but let me ask you a <laughs> question about two economists that, whose views you endorse. I'm talking about mm -hmm. Karl Polanyi and uh, Thomas Piketty. You uh, approvingly quote Thomas Piketty, particularly his argument about uh, rising inequality across the world and here in the United States, and you mention his point that everyone who attains the age of 25 in Europe should get 125,000 euros as inheritance. I was struck by this because uh, I did not see any discussion on what one might do with this money. And I was also struck by the fact that you do not ever in your book mention Dr. Amartya Sen or his human capabilities approach. You see, Dr. Sen, mm -hmm. as you know very well, took issues with uh, John Rawls' theory of distributive justice and said, it's not enough to divvy up the pie in equal parts and give it to people. More important is to ensure that they have the capacities, the capabilities to live the life they uh, value and make something of what they get. I don't see any of that in your vision mm -hmm. of the good enough life. Briefly, what mm -hmm. do you think mm -hmm. is the reason for that? Mm -hmm. So on, on the Piketty 125,000 euros, you know, I, again, I think you're right. The other thing is that I, I don't say in the book, but in my mind, I always think, is this just for Europe? That's not enough. This really has to be much more global than, than that. This isn't just about making more rich people in one continent, it doesn't solve the problem. Um, but, you know, people would, start a business or they buy a home, um, they maybe would create a cooperative with some, like, you know, you could use this as a kind of foundation for going about your life. You could pay off some debt depending on where you are. It's hard to say exactly because in this system, a lot has changed and Piketty's kind of redistribution system. Um, I, I do mention very briefly at one point, uh, the United Nations uh, Human Development Index and, and the work that Sen did uh, along with um, right. Martha Nussbaum kind of after him um, to develop this idea of the capabilities approach. And I, I think it's quite interesting and, and rich and um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm kind of on board with a lot of it. I think sometimes in their articulations of things, and I should say also it was Sen's introduction to Smith's theory of moral sentiments that kind of got me to finally read that book and then realize it was a big part of the puzzle I was trying to understand. So I think there is something in the background there. Um, but I think sometimes the capabilities approach focuses on, very interestingly, right, on things like 
our ability to reason as, as part of what we you know our development our ability to form connections with others our affiliations a very very profound and interesting very complex view of what it means to to be human and to have a quality and i very much appreciate that and take that on board i think sometimes there's a slight less focus on the, the economic equality side of it and i think you know they kind of go back and forth Nussbaum and, and sen on where that fits in but i think you're right i think there's another version of this book that goes deeper into that that approach uh and and makes more of it and makes more of a companion with it so thank Dr. you for that. albert we are almost out of time let me conclude this interview by asking you one last question you have made a compelling argument uh, for creating a good enough society. What do you think lay folks can do to create a good enough world? Very briefly, I'm afraid we are almost out of time. I think <laughs> it's such a wonderful question. I knew this was going to be your last question, and I wish I had a better answer for it. But I think in getting involved in your community, um, thinking about what it would mean to create a world in which you can really flourish because everyone around you is flourishing. How do you go about that? I'd love to know your answers. Please, please let me know as well. Uh, but I'm also just, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for these very engaging questions. Um, and I hope I didn't go on too long, but I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Alpert. It was a great pleasure talking to you. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. That's it for this episode of Ideas and Insights. Thanks for joining us today. Next week, we will discuss a new book by Professor Elizabeth Shermer on the scourge of student loans, indentured students, how government guaranteed loans left generations drowning in college debt, published by Harvard University Press last year. In this book, the author, Dr. Elizabeth Shermer, analyzes the plight of 45 million Americans who collectively owe student loans to the tune of $1.5 trillion. She unravels the history of the dysfunctional federal student loan system and explains why college debt has skyrocketed and made higher education unaffordable. Join us next week for an exciting discussion with Professor Elizabeth Shermer. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.